welcome back after lunch. Uh, this session is now called uh, Critical Projections. And it could also be called something like what can architect architecture do or the agency of architecture or the agency of the architect. So the concept of critical projections was one of the theme areas within the strong research environment uh, architecture in effect. And it draws on a discourse that emerged uh, in 1968, inquiring into architecture's ability to inter interact critically with its politically, political and socio-economic underlying structures. So the question was then, can architecture be a critical project? So in 1968, architectural historian Manfredo Tafuri, to whom this debate on critical architecture was once attributed, so it was not him who considered himself uh, possibly uh, as, somebo as somebody speaking about critical architecture per se, but this discussion, this discourse came up 30 years later with an art article that was written in 2002 by Robert Somol and uh, Sarah Whiting and was taken up by other people. Um, so Tafuri was at that time at 68, he was just appointed uh, chair of his, the history department at the architecture school in Venice. And in Venice he began his ambitious historical project and simultaneously led uh, the institutional transformation of his department, which under Tafuri came to be known as the Venice School of, hist uh, of, his of Architectural History. So the school would subsequently develop a reputation uh, uh, for its radically critical Marxist historical analysis of architecture. In Tafuri's reading, while architects were indeed capable of understanding uh, the contradictions that are produced by the uh, capitalist modern city, um, they themselves are part of uh, producing it, they were structurally incapable of solving the social contradictions they addressed, which consigned architecture to art and art to, quote, form without utopia uh, and to a position of sublime uselessness, quote. So that's a very often qu quoted quote by, by Tafuri. S ma but paradoxically, or what is interesting is that Tafuri himself was educated as an arch architect, as a practitioner, and he ma maintained also an architectural a professional practice in the early years of his academic career. But despite that, he supported the idea that uh, intellectual contributions um, came from the, to the architectural culture, they came from the historian and from the critic, and they were not, um, he would deny this critical role, he would uh, deny it to the uh, architectural practitioner. So they were not supposed to comment on that. So in the so-called projective turn of the early 2000s, uh, spearheaded by architects and theorists such as Sarah Whiting and Robert Somol, and also associated with uh, such names as Michael Speaks, um, demanded a revised approach to architectural practice, which um, they argued had been mired in the pessimism of a critical uh, architecture post Manfredo Tafuri. So their projective architecture turns away from a critical position and takes up a pragmatic approach that places an emphasis on performance uh, rather than method. Um, they describe it as cool, relaxed and easy and they contrasted it to a critical architecture which they described as hot, overly difficult, overworked and complicated. So nevertheless, the projective turn has also been critiqued for doing away too quickly with theory and the capability to criticality, uh, to, uh, to critically assess uh, and to critically assess its own activities. And I hope that uh, Roma in his presentation uh, would, <laughs> would uh, comment on that as he was also commenting, he was part of that discourse at the time. So more recently, uh, inquiries into the agency of architecture in a capitalist world have re-emerged. For instance, with the book, Can Architecture Be an Emancipatory Project? <coughs> in which the architecture theorist Nadia Lahiji <coughs> moderates an interdisciplinary dialogue about 
the agency of the architect or the agency of architecture. And he discusses here with architects and a philosopher uh, about that topic. And for example, here following Immanuel Kant and uh, Friedrich Hegel's notion of critique, um, the philosopher David Cunningham reminds us that critique is connected to the possible engendering of an emancipatory praxis that would work to free the subject from existing distortions. Um, but critique alone does not seem to suffice for engendering change. And this is, of course, also a very this is, an, is, a, is spoken from a quite enlightenment position with an ideal idea of what emancipa emancipation is or an emancip emancipatory practice could be. So that the question is then, wha what could that mean uh, today? So I suggest that the theoretical debate that has divided projective architecture from a critical approach uh, has contributed to concealing how the changing conditions of the market have actually shaped architectural practice. And f furthermore, this unfortunate division risks weakening the role of architecture in society. On the other hand, simultaneously, um, um, there is also a, a gr an increasing awareness of climate change a discussion and um, um, discourses, uh, debates on social and spatial injustices. And we see, even though, a more optimistic outlook for the social agency of art and architecture. Um, in recent years, the rethinking of architecture in social terms has been discussed with reference to the kinds of tactics tools and micro-practices that would be explored, for instance, through re reviving or creating commons and through transdisciplinary learning, that is by building new relations across academia, practice and disciplines and new subjectivities. And I hope that Katharina and uh, Ramya will address this uh, uh, issue in their presentations. So these critical practices are built on the conviction that civil society must and can be strengthened through micropolitical and post-capitalist practices as a base for a democratic society. And that architects indeed have a role to play here, not only by offering a social critique, but in their critical and creative capacity to envision projections of alternative futures. I claim uh, we owe the achievements of these emancipated practices also to the feminist and post-colonial discourses of the recent years. For example, uh, to the work of the philosopher Elisabeth Cross, who has, be, has extensively written on, on architecture. So Elisabeth, in her book, Architecture from the Outside, from 2001, just one year before the discourse on the pro uh, projective architecture started, Challenge, challenges both the notion of an autonomous critical practice and a pragmatic approach to architecture by introducing the complicated question of embodiment, diversity and multiplicity. And it is here that I see the contributions by Ranghild and by Karen. So to end this and then introduce the panel, which I should have done <laughs> before I started, um, the theme of critical projections within the strong research environment, uh, architecture in effect, foregrounds and explores architectures that rely on the interrelation of method and performance, strong and weak theory, criticality and projection to enable an ethical, politically and socially engaged, and that is an emancipatory practice for the future. Um, so we will hear now in this order Roma Fanton, who is Professor of Architectural Theory at UMIO, and uh, then Katharina Duschen, Professor Emerita Chalmers, uh, University of Technology, and Ramia Massé, the next person here, uh, professor of New Frontiers in Design of Aalto University, and then Gunnar Sandin, Associate Professor at Lund uh, Technical University, and Ranghild Klaasson, um, PhD candidate at, uh, in Urban Studies at Malmö Högskola. And then also Karin Reisinger, who is postdoc at KDH at the moment, and she's also teaching at the Technical University in Vienna. Hallo. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so 
Roma, if, would you like to start, please? Thank you very much for inviting me and to be a member of this panel on a, an issue which is very dear to me and very important. And what I will try to do in seven minutes, because we have to be short, uh, is that I start, as Micah said, with this critical projective debate and try to formulate what I think an other approach and route could be beyond that. So and if I go to the next image, I think it's just like this, isn't it? Yeah. It is not hard to imagine affluent communities protected by walls, watchtowers, searchlights, and machine guns, as Donald Trump and the European Committee have advocated, while the poor savage for food in the wastelands beyond. More encouraging today are the social movements seeking to sketch out new relations to, between globality and locality, diversity and solidarity. Confronted with an implacable political enemy and a fundamentalist one at that, we will no doubt be forced more and more to reflect upon the foundations of our own civilizations and on what another civic imagination or what kind of other civic imagination could be enacted. Critique has been the primary mode of resistance, but a growing dissatisfaction with the political capacities of critique is emerging, facing the many crises and disasters our bewildering modernity is producing. The persistence of melancholy as a primary effect of much contemporary critical theory derives from the recognition of this inability of critique to fulfill its transformative promises. And yet such expressions of dissatisfaction with critique from an often disenchanted elite uh, are generally not accompanied, accompanied by propositions of a different practice of theory as political, economic, and aesthetic intervention. With the critical so-called only interpreting the world in various ways, the projective point was to change the world. The projective was all about engaging the real, including its perplexing mutations, the, to be popular, hoping to be able to communicate with the world at large and to transform it from within, to stay with the trouble, so to speak, as Donna Haraway in her latest book uh, spoke about. The problem of the projective, advocated by Samuel and Whiting, has been its apolitical orientation and absence of social commitment. In many projects, although being projective, I observed something which I called at the time fresh conservatism. Fresh conservatism stands for a condition in which deregulated capital and post-democracy complemented each other, I think, perfectly. Culture plays a decisive role in this. Fresh conservatism is a situation where a certain degree of conflict, subversion, and radicalism serve as a stimulant and identity politics, thus forming an essential element in a fragmented society where the results of conflicts in power distribution are swept under the carpets. Recently, Nancy Fraser introduced a similar oxymoron, progressive neoliberalism. And in its US form, she says, progressive neoliberalism like fresh conservatism, is an alliance of mainstream currents of new social movements, feminism, anti-racism, multiculturalism on the one side, and high-end symbolic and surface-based business sectors like Wall Street, Silicon Valley, and Hollywood, she says, on the other side. In this alliance, progressive forces are effectively joined with the forces of cognitive capitalism, especially the financialization. The breaking down of cultural hierarchies is clearly to be welcomed in this process, for the most part. However, it is less the upshot of genuinely democratic spirit than an effort of the commodity form, which levels existing values rather than contesting them in the name of alternative priorities. We should not forget that these forms of what you can call revolutionary conservatisms uh, free from any nostalgia of what we know from classical conservatism, are neoliberal forces prepared to accommodate the new of the uncontrolled social forces. 
only in order to channel them in constantly reinvented forms of private wealth. It is a speculative orientation towards the future, poised between the self-revolutionizing orientation of credit-based temporality and the imperative of sustaining tradition via, via the private distribution of wealth. What the above hopefully makes clear is that we cannot continue the experiences of the last century. Both the critical and projective will not do, I think. Alternatives need to be projected beyond those revolutionary conservatisms. I believe we have to imagine the possibility of something else based on a new idea of the collective, the common and the individual, based on hybrid formations, and confront the many forms of struggle in concrete situation today, what Mike also called the micro-politics. Paradoxical communities are emerging, uh, says Julia Kristeva, made up of foreigners who are reconciled with themselves to the extent that they recognize themselves as foreigners. In our world, she says, at the beginning of the 21st century, each is fated to remain the same and the other without forgetting his original culture, but putting it in perspective to the extent of having it not only exist side by side, but also alternate with others' culture. Now that we belong, what you could say in the words of uh, Julia Kristeva, to paradoxical communities, you could say that we all in fact have become cosmopolitan, a citizen of the world. But we have to be very careful and make a distinction between globalization and the cosmopolitization. Globalization is primarily a one-dimensional economic growth to be understood in terms of the free flow of capital, commodities and labor across national borders. In contrast, cosmopolitization should be considered to be multidimensional, seeing it as a process that has irreversibly change the historical nature of social worlds and the standing of states, nation states in this world. Cosmopolitization is about the development of multiple loyalties as well as the increase in diverse transnational forms of life. This cosmopol cosmopolitan outlook, as Ulrich Bax has called it, if we really observe her, has its home in amazement in the expanding in-between, in which seemingly eternal certainties, borders and differentiations become blurred and effaced. Here we find transcending identities, something we might think in terms of multiplicities. Every individual has to orient oneself, to find oneself among one's multiple personalities, with the help of others who can be abstract or ideal others, memories, stories, symbols, or institutional emblems. In extreme terms, we need to ask ourselves, says Etienne Balibar, the question, can difference and sharing, conflict and the general interest be thought together? In short, this means that the arrival of the foreign or the foreigner and the changes and chances it and she he brings can in fact on many fronts stand central to the discipline of architecture as a source of ideas, I think, uh, concerning the material and spatial construction of our human environment. In that sense, to summarize it with one sentence, you could say that the foreign and migration in, among all, all of us fuels and can fuel innovation. And that it should not be feared, but should be welcomed in order so the paradoxical communities need to be welcomed, and uh, that means that the foreign should be embraced in order to innovate our society. So the immigrant brings innovation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mikey, for the introduction and Romer for, for this framing, to which I will connect, I think, in several ways. 
this is a story of a, a global movement starting very locally. Uh, we want it to be a change, a cultural change in knowledge formation. Uh, it was containing, started with research se seminars in a small group. Um, a philosopher, Philip de Grave from uh, Kao Leuven, uh, to a couple of architects, Nell Janssens from uh, St. Lucas in Belgium, um, Fredrik Nilsson and I from Chalmers, and eventually uh, also Matthias Serholm and Rolf Hughes was in it, and uh, from fine arts faculty, Johan Oeber, and eventually Hélène Prichou was in the group. So um, it, the movement started with research seminars and workshops, continued uh, two sessions, two two-day sessions of a PhD course, and eventually into an international sym symposium between the years 2013 to 2015. Um, connected to the topics listed below, uh, I will come back to that. We started uh, with the manifesto. Uh, and you can see some highlights uh, in yellow. Um, basically because we were mad at uh, the Bologna evaluation system. Reducing knowledge to what is measurable, what can be uh, paragraphed, and what can be put into statistics and then evaluating in accordance within that systems and given money. So uh, we, were, we searched for deeper modes of searching knowledge. And we saw the, a possibility then through arts. So in the middle, so let us artists, architects, and philosophers involved in research unshackle Bologna from its measurement systems. This is what we wrote in 2013. Um, and we imagined a future university much more flexible, movable, and in, in a way uh, touching upon what Romer was, was talking about and what you uh, discussed. This is what, what we saw as the transvaluation, the real uh, made dream. Um, we started reading a lot, uh, fiction and theory and philosophy. Uh, this is from Marcel Proust. Uh, only art allows us to step out of ourselves to understand how someone else looks at the universe. Thanks to art, we do not see one single word, ours, but a multiplicity or literally a multiplication of worlds. Other outsets uh, from philosophical, uh, philosophy, uh, philosophical side uh, was from Friedrich Nietzsche uh, on, on transvaluation and the way values are justified uh, through aesthetic phenomena, but also the counterpart, the existence of art is justified only as a worldly phenomenon. And a quick quotation from Deleuze, art is resistant. Um, and then understanding also from this what makes history, both in, in knowledge making and the writing of history, which has been touched upon this morning, um, regarding how do we now prepare the future, prepare history. Um, And uh, also a lot of reading from within architecture theory um, and how the economic dominance uh, is, um, you could say, conditioned by the urban, urban defined by the urban, and uh, discussed in, in terms of urban conventions. Um, from John Law, another, uh, how to develop a re repertoire but we, by which we can reimagine uh, knowledge, reimagine how architecture may work and, and uh, 
promote worldly uh, aspects. And also using the artistic mode of syncretic thinking, putting together things, disparate things, and recognizing what may happen in collisions and the under, unexpected. Um, we had lectures in the PhD course, which I think also connects to to what Matthias uh, Scherholm, this is part of his lecture uh, in 2014, uh, the challenges of anthropomorphism. And he also talked about um, then the speculative realism and what the materiality may include in terms of being visible, being touchable, being makeable, but also partly disguised. And uh, in this way, we were connected to Graham Harmon and his speculative um, reality and how objects are partly dormant and can never be fully known, but they participate in uh, exploring and exposing changes. Bah. End of story. No. <laughs> ah. Uh, oh, Matthias Serholm was also at that time uh, discussing the allure as as a process and um, uh, how this could. Uh, seduce you almost to the slow production of no new faces of new of alteration the, in the multiple object so we did a lot of workshops within this small group uh, we expanded it into a kind of experimental theoretical uh, phd course um, which some of you might have participated in and um, and eventually ended in the in the uh, uh, symposium, where we put the four themes to the left be left below: Polet poetics of value, the the making of values through materiality, the politics of value, how this is connected to politics and political conditions, worlding that is the making itself, and the spaces for possibilities, the utopos. Um, and we had key uh, three key statement speakers, Aryun Apadurai, who is uh, a global cultural social anthropologist and from the New York School, which he started, and discusses a lot how grassroots movements can change. Okay. Uh, Andrea Phillips, curator and uh, artistic researcher, discussing... Um, economy conditions of, of art, and Graham Harmon, which I mentioned before. Just a few, uh, this was how we worked at the symposium, and um, trying to grasp an outset for future movement. Uh, so it was not a very regular form of conference, but uh, a lot of talk, and then there was the publishing, but that's a different story. Thank you. Like Katharina, I will tell you a story. Uh, I'm honored to speak about a book uh, on behalf of editors Michael Schalk, Therese Christiansen, myself, Rami Maze, our book designer, Mariam Fani, and 40 contributors, many of whom are hopefully even in this room. Uh, Feminist Futures of Spatial Practice is a book that came out of a course. It's the culmination of a series of dialogues and activities uh, initiated within a course called Architecture and Gender, um, in 2012, the course was themed Feminist Futures, organized here in Stockholm by the Critical Studies Unit at the KTH School of Architecture in collaboration with the Art Project, the New Beauty Council, and the organization Women in Swedish Performing Arts. 
and quite significantly, the course was relocated outside of the academy uh, onto the premises in the center of Stockholm of WISP, the Women in Swedish Performing Arts. It was open to beyond students, to professionals, and the public as well. And I'll come back to that theme a little bit along the way, kind of uh, challenging uh, looking from the outside uh, of the academy at critical themes that are often confined within the academy, perhaps flirting uh, with academic norms, hierarchies, and so on. In this course, uh, Mike and Therese invited me uh, to give a lecture and a workshop together with my colleague, Josephine Wengel. And our lecture session was one of 10 sessions in the course in 2011, each with a lecture and a workshop. The lecture that I gave together with Josephine was in the format of a dialogue between future, study, uh, uh, future studies, her discipline, and design, my discipline. So we gave a lecture in the form of a dialogue and we gave a workshop. Here you can see some of the, the participating students' impressions from the workshop, the formula for which we, we, we uh, uh, wrote up when we uh, came to the book later. Workshops were an important pedagogical foundation in the course, enabling experiential and embodied engagement with the lecture content. This constructive aspect was crucial to move beyond analysis and theorizing. In the course, there was an effective mix of practical concrete examples with theories, references, and methods all directed at working, teaching, organizing, and designing. As the course concluded, many of us felt a sense of urgency to further develop our common ground. Hence, the idea for a book kind of evolved into a, a formal process for developing the content of the book. Uh, here uh, was one of, this is the round table discussion, one of five, that I participated in, in with my eventual uh, co-authors in, in, in the book. This one was, uh, all the round table sessions were organized in 2004 by Maika and Therese, many here at Arcdes. Uh, and since the roundtables, I joined the editorial team. Roundtables took the form of intimate conversations of texts circulated in advance. Those were closely read and carefully commented by participants and a designated peer reviewer for each roundtable. And maybe a comment on the notion of peer review and flirting a bit with per peer review, uh, which is one of those quality control mechanisms demanded by the academic system in which many of us work. Just as standard academic peer review, also editorial standards, style guides, and so on, have their normativities and exclusions. And all of this thinking through these procedures uh, and ways of working was, was part of this whole process. So at the roundtables, importantly, uh, peer review, we use that, we wanted to adapt that to support feminist forms of dialogue and pedagogy, including peer learning with a different notion of power and relation. Instead of the blind peer review and judgment uh, at a distance through email, uh, typical in academic journals, our re review process evolved through the pleasure of conversation, if I borrow a term that Mel Nell Jensen uses in her prologue within the book to the section called Dialogues. Peer review is a full-bodied experience of meetings across disciplines in which all participants acted as peer reviewers, peer-to-peer -peer reviewers, to one another. Hence, we consider the process of developing, editing, and designing the book as a critical feminist practice in itself, nurturing our own and other voices and beings and bodies in dialogue. Themes emerged and were reshaped before and after the round tables. Here you see two, and I'll show you more of the themes marked at the top of these columns. And these were the, the uh, papers that eventually emerged and formed out of this dialogue and writing process within and around the round tables. Rather than speaking on behalf uh, about the contents of other people's articles, I will let the titles speak for themselves, and you can have a minute to look through. Here 
Here you've had a fleeting taste of many of the topics uh, and the, the playful words and connotations and themes and conversations that emerged within this book from 40 contributors spanning architecture, the arts, art history, curating, cultural heritage study, environmental sciences, future studies, film visual communication, design and design theory, queer intersectional and gender studies, political sciences, sociology, urban planning, and more. We are, this is the cover of the book, in the back cover of the book you can see everyone listed there. We are uh, knowingly uh, and understanding that uh, this presents limitations as well. We are predominantly female uh, and have operated and generated this book out of approximate and Western network. Partly due, uh, mostly due to the beginnings of the book within a course and it's contributing uh, uh, and as it's contributing lectures who were able to be here and continue to participate in Stockholm. <coughs> But notably, uh, and perhaps due to educational beginnings of the book in a course, we've been very attentive to different generations, uh, emerging voices as well as established and very experienced perspectives. Within the introductory chapter to the book, co-authored, oh, I can also just point out um, this uh, 40 voices and the, the notion of of a kind of presenting multiple voices manifested also in this kind of flirting, even in the margins of the book with notions of how to phrase the copyright and how to think about the voices and the ownership over the content of the book. The introduction to the book, which is uh, co-authored with Mike, uh, myself, Therese, and Mariam Fani, the designer, notably also discussing the form of the book and how the form embodies the content of the book, uh, expresses what we believe is perhaps a uniting motivation behind the book. And we start by situating this book and, and therefore the dialogue that emerged since the course within a rapidly changing and diversifying world in which many institutions and professions, architecture not only, are rethinking the values enacted through our practices. And we asked ourselves, can we act, each of us, from within our everyday practices as humans, activists, scholars, educators, Within ourselves, our communities, and our institutions, how can we act in the here and now and change or affect the future? And our standpoint as editors was to understand ourselves, our institutions, and futures to be constructed, and therefore we committed to uh, understanding the construction of possible futures in particular terms. And feminism, uh, uh, continues to be one of the most powerful movements for social justice, for developing towards a future in very particular terms. Uh, feminism proposes perhaps a range of diverse, critical, creative, and inclusive visions for the rights of all bodies, identities, and viewpoints. And in the introductory chapter, we unfold different modalities and histories of feminisms, um, different modes of scholarship and learning, uh, and different ways of doing scholarship also as a practice. Uh, we also define and kind of expand notions of spatial practice to include architectural, artistic, design, and other disciplinary and interdisciplinary practices, building on Jane Rendell's conceptualization of critical and feminist spatial practices. But very importantly, we also take up themes of time, not accepting space as it is, but from a feminist perspective, understanding how things can be different or otherwise. And we take time rather concretely uh, throughout the book and in the introduction as a modality of change. And we deconstruct that from various perceptions through Bell Hooks's visionary feminism, Fanny Soderbeck's revolutionary time, and through Gross's, Elizabeth Gross's notion of embodied utopia. Um, and I could say a lot about that, uh, but I will uh, point you to the book and also to what we hope is one of the great assets of the book in addition to the chapters, our effort to make a collective bibliography across 
all of the articles in a book. Each article has a very distinct voice and writing practice. The authors are so diverse, they follow the style guide and citation practices of their own discipline. In the references list, we try to cut, create a common ground, a common library of references, forcing us all and you to encounter other references while seeking your own. And we recommend that you order these all to your library if you're interested in fe uh, feminist futures of spatial practice. Um, uh, you can read more on the book as well. And just to mention, we have the book is only now published. We want to unfold it through a series of continuing dialogues, not ending in an object, but using the book to continue this movement that has now been kind of unfolding in various dialogical ways uh, since 2001. Welcome to a book launch tomorrow night. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this session. Um, I am one of the authors in this book. And I'm, um, I'm currently a PhD student at Malmö University Urban Studies, as Melke said. Uh, before I entered academia, I was uh, working for many years in the cultural heritage uh, field, a field which I now, as a researcher, um, research, study. And I will talk about one of my studies, right? I will talk about one of my studies uh, where I focused on a citizen perspective on the narrating urban space. And I here think of making cultural heritage as act of acts of performativity, where the actual reiteration of certain na narratives legitimizes these as cultural heritage while excluding other narratives. And I think of preservation as a tradition in itself, sometimes more important than the past or a past per se. In the study, I problematized knowledge production and elaborated on Donna Haraway's concept situated knowledges and bell hooks approach to see from the margin, where the marginalized position, according to hooks, can be an advantageous position from where both the inside and outside perspective and center and margin can be understood. The attempt in the study was to practically engage these concepts into a collaborative handicraft work on a narrating urban space where memories of local as well as global or distant narratives, memories, pasts, and places meet in the here and now. The title, uh, Doing Heritages, Places of the Past and Future Inside Out Through Women in Rosengold, uh, was actually a very early working title, and I don't know how it ended up in the printed program, so I have to say something about that. The title in brackets is the title that ended up in the publication. Um, so uh, anyway, the women in Rose and Gord refers to a group of women, including myself, um, who met in a series of handicraft workshops in Rose and Gord in Malmö. Uh, the inside out refers to the way we kind of pulled and connected memories of the past and knowledges about places near and far through our hands and handicraft into the contemporary environment, making new knowledge together. Uh, we visualized or projected hopes and dreams for the future. And for this to happen, space and the future had to be imagined as, as, as open and uh, accessible for us. And according to the geographer Doreen Massey, this is also fundamental for making changes. I collaborated with the Grassroots Women Association and an artist, which I know as a close friend, and she helped me create an atmosphere of friendship and trust in the workshops, which I couldn't have done from the very beginning all by myself. And we needed a safe space, as sharing of memories and dreams can be a very vulnerable exercise. 
We all had various experiences of living in Sweden and elsewhere in the world. Many women had lived in Asian countries before moving to Sweden. Some of us lived in Rosengård at the time, a neighborhood where more than 100 nationalities are said to be represented, and also a place marginalized from social status with Malmö's lowest welfare index, according to the city's own statistics. We had three workshops where we elaborated on past, present and future. We shared memories by narrating around objects that we had brought, like photos, jewelry and clothes. We also investigated local environments around Malmö and shared hopes and responsibilities or feelings of responsibility for the future. In playful textile applications, cardboard models and other handicraft materials, we let the places, objects, memories and hopes all merge together. For example, many Malmö citizens live in overcrowded flats, which makes outdoor meeting places very important. But Sweden is cold, often also in summers. So we imagine warm places to socialize and get close. One woman remembered a dark evening in Tehran, mountains rising high in the night and snow falling. She was sitting with a family around a low table, under blankets, drinking tea, and keeping warm and cozy. Her grandmother told stories from when she was a little girl. And this was a memory we all could relate to, having similar experiences or hopes. The memory inspired us to make such places in Malmö. And we also imagined baking bread in public places, in, in the pl public ovens, bread to go with the tea and to keep warm. And we settled for an Asian tandoor oven, which bakes thin flatbread in a few minutes. Um, Meanwhile, during the same period as our workshops, the city of Malmö received funding from EU's Regional Development Fund to make Rosengård more sustainable and more attractive for new visitors, new residents and new investors. One sub-project was to make a bicycle path from the prosperous rich Western Harbour to the eastern poor Rosengård, making the path legible through adding light and bicycle hand raising in strong deviant colours pink and orange. In our workshops as a pedant, we imagined our meeting places along a similar east-western line, but in various places around the city and in uh, more rather integrated than uh, integrated into urban space than uh, sing signaling a deviant color. In the last workshop, <clears throat> we invited municipal urban planners into the process. We presented our proposal, contextualizing the need for these places, telling stories about baking in public space and drinking tea under blankets. And in the picture, you see a demonstration of how the tandoor oven works. The planners asked us with the uh, right. Uh, <laughs> um, the planners answered with spontaneous yes when asked if they liked the proposal and if they could imagine themselves making use of these meeting places. And they said that we could never have come up with this idea. However, they wouldn't label these places as cultural heritage, even if they thought the low tables and ovens already were heritage, but in other countries. In discussion groups, the planners contributed with suggestions of ways to realize the proposal financially, practically and legally. And to conclude, for a short while, we opened up an unexpected planning space in the margin of the city for countering dominant national heritage narratives. The, mus the municipal planners made a physical shift, moving their bodies from the central planning office to our marginalized position to see the city together with us from our perspective and to produce knowledge with us. We exchanged roles with the planners they took part in our planning process and our way of, way of framing space instead of the other way around, as is the usual procedure. I suggest that we destabilize habitual, habitual ways of narrating and planning by performing and situating local, glo local global knowledge together 
and by acknowledging inside and outside perspectives of the world uh, as seen from a place otherwise marginalized in planning practice. Thank you. Hi, and uh, thank you so much for presenting a small uh, research narrative, which is part of an ongoing reflection on sites of uh, preservation and exploitation. Actually, I selected uh, pink uh, funds for this presentation, but it's fine with green, actually. Maybe it's even better. <laughs> so, uh, in order to keep the seven minutes, uh, uh, I will uh, right jump into the thing. So, uh, in short, this project comes from two sides. First, it tackles uh, significant ecological changes caused by humans in collaboration with economy, etc., with significant impacts on everyday lives. Second, it tackles the necessities uh, of archiving uh, different perspectives in these contexts, feminist, indigenous, non-human perspectives with myriads of intersectionalities. Don Haraway has ended uh, her last book, and I'm glad that this uh, has been quoted quite several times this day, uh, with the Camilla stories, describing the work of the children of compost, building community in destroyed environments and reconnecting with the environment as a mutual encounter, caring for and living in destroyed environments. I was interested in the stories uh, of embracing the traumatic changes which Haraway had narrated together with Fabrizio de Ranova and Vincian Desprez, also narrating the potentials of archiving what is still left and has disappeared as the speakers for the dead who bring into ongoing presence through active memory the lost life ways so that other sym symbiotic and sympoietic commitments would not lose heart. This view gave me the opportunity to look at mining areas, for example in the north of Sweden, from a different perspective than before. From a perspective of women, indigenous and non-humans who seldom have a place in the image of exploitation and economic profit uh, of a male-dominated world with a male-dominated history. Since the 50s, the community of Mount Berget is facing drastic changes because it was growing very close to the mine. It grew with the mine, also profiting from the gains of the mine in relative wealth for a long period. Today again, 5,000 people have to move to make place for further exploitation. Malmberg is disappearing from the map and parts of the history with it. In 2016, the town ran an impressive exhibition, Documentira Malmberg, in the sports hall. Tord Pettersson and Leif Payervi have built a model in the scale of 1 to 200 of the whole town. A further part of this exhibition is a huge collection of photos of every house that has disappeared or is going to disappear. The exhibition was mostly funded by LKB, LKB a state-owned uh, Swedish mining company. The material of the archive belongs to them. A small part of the exhibition concerned the Queen Olive, women's life in, uh, of Malmberget, mostly concerned with lifestyle, but with the participant Margareta Poyanen, also with political movements demanded by women. This, of course, opened the question uh, for further perspectives to be included. The indigenous perspective of Sami people. Colonized for centuries, they have to live in coexistence with the mine but their activities like reindeer herding, for example, and I emphasize for example, uh, and coexistence and communication with nature is heavily interfered by the increasing environmental destructions through the mine. Their absence in the exhibition, but at the same time presence in the archive from LKB, opens also questions to other ways of doing memory and archiving, fostered by indigenous notions like, nature is our library, by Henrik Blind, or Land Pierce the History, by Christina Selin McNeil, and Places also work as History of Memories, by Solveig Jox, as well as stories are dynamic, and the storyteller is not only conveying, but also experiencing the places. So according to Haraway, the speakers for the dead are also asked with, with bringing into mind and heart the new things of Earth, 
also the emerging kinds of being and ways of life of an always evolving homeworld. The speakers for the dead also release the energies of the past, present and future with its myriad tentacles of opportunistic, dangerous and generative symbiosis. Thus, we could also include the story of the peregrine falcon, whose number increased because of the mining activities. Especially predator birds appreciate the earth and stone walls of mines and settled down in a pit nearby. But we must not forget that many other species are threatened by the extensions of the mines. So not being able to go into details right now, I hope that uh, I have at least shown how this small research narrative opens up complex questions. How can we embrace destroyed environments in memory and archiving? How can we archive what, have, uh, what we have lost or about to lose? Which perspectives are left out? How could we include them? Who should do this task of the othering the existing, but often one-dimensional archives? So myself, being pretty other to the situation as an incoming researcher, but as an educated architect with interest in steel, part of the complicity, maybe I'm not the right person to write down these stories, but at least I can rely on a carrier bag that is full of the othering stories about falcons, women and indigenous in mining histories, areas and open pits. The othering is writing against the methods of othering, as Spivak has described as the other uh, telling the other who has the power, framing the other as pathological and immoral, and finally, that knowledge is part of the self and not the other, is that then it is a collection of stories about the power of the other, for example, Marm Berry's Quinoglob, the moral or rather ethics of the other, for example, Sami knowledge on sustainability and doing history, and finally, stories of knowledge of the Sami or the skills of the peregrine falcon, who is able to adapt to destroyed environments. Thus, it is not yet a method of writing stories, but rather a method of going through the woods as a visitor who is collecting mushrooms, but only as much as she needs. The othering thus could work as a method, oh, sorry. The othering thus could work as a method of taking responsibility but as it is constructed now, with LKABS possessing all the archival material of Malm period, we have to face the possibility of non-exclusive exclusion, a term I borrow from the Bora de Bandanovsky and Viveros de Castro, which a strategic essentialism wants to avoid. Or, to say it with psychotherapy, there are limits to the othering. However, the question of the othering is complex and uh, cannot be explored in a few minutes. And it takes quite some care to deal with the options and work against capitalist absorption. Therefore, I think it's necessary to activate and access the other in the common archive in order to make a relational and dynamic culture also visible in a public archive and to move from otherness to a position where an indigenous feminist non-human culture and history show the living traditions, but is embedded in a larger and complex context within the ecology of an archive. Thank you. I think, um, do you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, I think many of us are here because we are interested in uh, land use, perhaps not in the sense that geography often defines it, but what happens on land. So I will start uh, in the end. I, will, I think I will keep my computer like this. Uh, in the end of what, in the end of Earth, the earth, <clears throat> as well as each living body inhabiting it, sometimes show itself as a fragile thing with but a thin borderline away from catastrophe. This state of existence related to survival uh, is itself a kind of criticality that is always in the back of our minds and for research 
notions like resilience and sustainability can be closer to that sense of criticality than we often tend to think of. The Earth which we have been inclined to relate to as a natural or neutral even state of environmental conditions has recently drastically turned into something very much uh, more thought of as being in the hands of ourselves or in the hands of what might be felt as a second form of nature, perhaps even a stronger form of nature. Uh, namely, the self-generative and unstoppable organism of capitalism that eats nature. And the awareness of what we actually are aware of in these matters has also turned into a matter of write-out political quarrel, at worst leading to hasty decisions with long-term consequences that repre represent rigid standpoints rather than experienced realities. I will, however, in the following, address criticality, not so much from this point of view, but rather as we have done already, all of us here, uh, not so much as perhaps a felt condition, but as an intentional act. In being critical, you can choose to stand outside of the practices you are criticizing, safely taking a distant critical position, but you can also be drastically part of those conditions, as several of the speakers have already shown here. Uh, by being critically projective, alluding to the title of this session, we have also the word projective, uh, which Romer already uh, dwelled on, uh, evoking notions of a projective cast, a cast both with and without an E, that could be associated with the practice of architects. By being critically projective, as Mike uh, started by uh, elaborating on also, you are assumed to take a more operative part in the practice of the practice and direct a critique towards both the circumstance at hand, but perhaps also towards the position of the practice itself. We may, of course, on a daily basis, be critical of, for instance, densification, of wasting green areas, or of strategic greenwashing. We may be critical of the ignorance of the effects of climate change, of warfare, or of overrated statements about the, these issues or their causes. Uh, but how do we maneuver our own criticality and our own position in regard to the context in which, in which we position ourselves. The critical stance, uh, that is, to be critical, demands of you a risky positioning of yourself. Being critically projective demands somehow that you are both inside and outside of the safe haven that usually defines the business, whether that business is about research as usual, making buildings as usual, or acting as a human being as usual. In a sub-project uh, to architecture in effect, I took an interest in these kinds of positioning issues, illustrating through uh, what we might call artistic or activist artistic positionings. I did uh, also by this uh, addressing a period of time uh, where I felt that the activist standpoint was sort of declining in its, in its um, role and, uh, uh, of being uh, critical, of becoming itself in crisis, you could say. I will see if I can find now some images. Oops. It's about to set the hair. So, yeah. And this, uh, this role I called uh, of, of addressing the positioning within institutional critique, I called double institutional articulation. And I have not the time here to go into depth with what I mean by this, but I addressed this 
question uh, by uh, looking at starting in, in, in uh, quite early, well, I think, f very well formulated um, uh, statements about what criticality can mean or in the sense of being both inside and outside of the institution that you are criticizing or that you are operating from when criticizing another institution. Uh, so I was interested in artistic acts where you could clearly see this double kind of addressing institutions. How much time do I have? So, One minute, which means that you will see a race now of uh, some uh, examples just uh, uh, of <laughs> this, uh, these artistic works, just to, just to show. The first one by Meryl Lederman Ukeles, uh, a work called Social Mirror, which is a garbage truck with polished metal sides reflecting the environments where it goes. In the same vein, she made this uh, performative work, you could call it, or action, or activist action, called Touch Sanitation, where she shook hands with 8,500 sanitation workers in New York, which took her 11 months to do. Another one is the architect Beate Hölmebach uh, and, and her firm uh, Mante Kula, with this uh, fence, uh, surrounding uh, a prison in uh, a prison garden in Bergen, Norway. A third one uh, was CUP, uh, Center for Urban Pedagogy, with their consultant, um, you could call it uh, um, activities, neither positioning themselves as architects or artists or uh, legal advisors, but uh, addressing all of these. The early ma Matrix Feminist uh, Cooperative, uh, introducing new ways of addressing clients. The artist Michael Asher, I won't go into detail, uh, but he, everything he did was uh, an investigation of the institution where he was invited to exhibit. The Swedish, at, at the time, art student Anna Odell, who made the work Ocean uh, Kvinna, Unknown Female, uh, which had a, a long range of consequences uh, as a work and as um, alteration of regulations in both school systems and uh, in, within hospitals. So just to conclude then, I found in the end these principal forms of double institutional articulation that were, uh, could go on of course. I more or less collect these four forms from from one or two or three of the artists uh, that were uh, examinated here. And, I, and I, I, I looked upon them also as uh, advocates of institutional critique that a little bit deviates. By going myopically into their work, you also escape what is usually called institutional critique in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, and so forth, which I think are two uh, boxed. And uh, the last then thought here is how are these types of double institutional articulation possible to pursue as also research uh, strategies and tactics. Thank you.